Gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Mr. Speaker, point of personal privilege. Gentlemen, may proceed. Mr. Speaker, as you all know, yesterday the budget came out, and I'd have to say that's probably the most important thing we do down here in Richmond. And let me commend our new chairman, Chairman Jones, for a great job, all the subcommittee chairmen and the folks on the other side of the aisle that I think helped to make our appropriations process very good. Let me give you a few highlights from that because I think it's very important. First of all, we had two or three really core things we're trying to get accomplished for a structural balance and core functions of government. One of the things we did was try to take care of our own, and those are our state employees. And one of our goals is to make sure our Virginia retirement system is whole. And so one of the things we did is we moved up by three years fully funding those VRS rates, which I think really secures their retirement. Number two, the health care safety net. We did $118 million for our hospitals, and that particularly helps our rural hospitals. $111 million for nursing homes, $6 million for our free clinics and community health centers, who I think do tremendous work and exponentially expand that money. And something that's been, I think, on the heart of folks on both sides of the aisle, and that's 750 ID and 65 DD waivers, and I think the House has been a leader over the last 10 years in that area. Let's go to higher education. $210 million more for higher education. We had two emphasis. First of all, we hear so much, especially from our Northern Virginia friends, on getting our in-state students to qualify in school. And so one of our commitments was to fund 1,700 new slots at William & Mary, UVA, James Mass, and Virginia Tech, and make sure we had the funding for those new seats. And so in this budget, I'm proud to say $6 million to deal with that issue of access. How about affordability in the budget? A lot of your college students and parents will tell you the biggest problem, obviously, is trying to afford college. I can certainly speak to that with two in college. One of the things we did is we put $20 million in additional money into tuition moderation. Now, I put some language in my speech yesterday that made it very clear that we expected those institutions to keep tuition at a bare minimum to make our colleges more affordable. Mental health. Certainly, that's been a big topic on the floor. We put an additional $10 million in the mental health for th basically three things. First of all, new state hospital beds. One of the things my wife does for a living is she is a, a psychiatric crisis counselor, and she does the night shift. And it's very, very tough. And she'll tell you three of the most important things you can do is that, pack teams, and drop-off centers. And PAC teams are nothing more than interdisciplinary teams that go out and make sure those people in crisis get the services they need and just simple things like their medications that can really keep them out of all institutions. And there are a lot of other stuff we did, $500 million additionally for K-12, pay raises and bonuses for state employees, funding for sheriffs, police officers, and more. But here's the real point of my speech today, because most of you were very familiar with the budget. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, all of this is in jeopardy because the Senate has decided to inject Washington-style politics into Virginia's budget process. And they've done that, obviously, with what they did with a Medicaid expansion in the budget. Let me remind you once again what we did last year. We formed something called the Medicaid Innovation Reform Commission called Merck. And Merck, of course, one of the purposes was to put reforms before Expansion. But let me remind you, the other big thing about Merck was to take this issue out of the budget process. It was agreed to by all conferees, Republicans and Democrats, it was agreed in conference in this final vote on the floor by both House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans. And once again, it was to avoid putting at risk things like K-12, higher ed, and that very money I just talked about. It was to avoid Washington-style gridlock. But despite this, the Senate has brought us right back to where we were one year ago. They've decided to play a high-stakes game of chicken for the sake of expanding Obamacare in Virginia. They've decided to hold hostage millions of dollars in funding for schools, teachers, police officers, and hospitals in exchange for Obamacare's Medicaid expansion. I have a long list of reasons for opposing Medicaid expansion, I have a long list of reasons for opposing the Senate version of Medicaid expansion. 
But regardless of where you are on the issue of Medicaid expansion, threatening to derail the entire budget is not acceptable, and it's certainly not the Virginia way. Mr. Speaker, I think you and most of the members of the House have been very clear about why we oppose Medicaid expansion. One of the primary reasons, Mr. Speaker, is that we have witnessed the problems with the implementation of the President's health care reform law. We think it would be irresponsible to further entangle Virginia and Washington health care mess. Let me remind you about the Affordable Care Law. If you recall, it was rushed. In one house, it was passed on Christmas Eve. In one house, it was passed in the dead of night. And frankly, over the last four years, the administration has been trying to cobble together and make the law work. And we can certainly remember the disastrous website. We've seen executive orders, basically, that I think gone beyond what we should be doing constitutionally. And we've also seen regulations all trying to fix this broken law. What the Senate has proposed, Mr. Speaker, is an enormous undertaking, not unlike that of Obamacare. We're going to have to do all kinds of things to make this plan work, from partnering with insurance companies to provide policies, writing regulations, finding the uninsured, signing them up through a website, confirming their eligibility, and then finally enrolling them in health plans. By including this in their budget, whether than as a standalone piece of legislation, the Senate is basically trying to do in two weeks what the federal government couldn't do in four years. This entire proposal is based on, if you look, three pages of language in the Senate budget. But we do not have any of the details what it's actually going to look like. For example, how much, of this, how much is this going to cost in the state budget to develop? What will be included in these private health care plans? How much will these insurance plans cost? Will the federal government approve the waiver requirements to implement this plan? None of these questions have been answered, and they're not going to be answered in the next two weeks. And before I conclude, you remember, last week I stood on this floor and talked a little bit about my counterpart in Arkansas, Bruce Westerman, who's the majority leader. And he gave some very wise advice. He was originally for Arkansas's sort of private pay model, which is really what the Senate plan is sort of devolved after. And he said this, which I think is great advice. Don't allow, don't allow yourself to be rushed, because there's always a push that you have to do something now. I kept pushing to wait and gather more information, but the governor was pushing very hard to do something now, and I think there is some buyer's remorse because of that. Mr. Speaker, Virginia cannot afford buyer's remorse. We have to take our time and work through this issue in a responsible way. Unfortunately, that's going to be very difficult in the environment that's been created by the demands of those on the other side of the aisle. Holding the budget hostage just for the sake of Obamacare is not just irresponsible, it's dangerous and unacceptable. It is definitely not the Virginia way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.